Hello everyone, and welcome to another Kerbal Space Program video. In today's Kerbal Space Program video, we will be building an SSTO, but it'll be an SSTO with a twist. The craft that you're currently watching being built is inspired by the Star Wars prequel ships. Specifically, it's based on the smaller Star Wars prequel ships that weren't equipped with hyperdrives. You see, in Star Wars, the hyperdrive is what enables ships to travel faster than light. But for ships like the Jedi Starfighters, incorporating such a drive was just not feasible. Enter the hyperdrive ring. The hyperspace transport ring was a device that provided hyperspace travel capabilities to starfighters with no onboard hyperdrive themselves. The way they worked is that the starfighter would go off and do whatever it is that starfighters do, and then once it needed to make the jump to hyperspace, it would dock with a ring structure which contained all of the hyperdrive components and provided the means necessary to make the trip through hyperspace. Keeping the hyperdrive as a separate vessel meant that starfighters could remain small and agile without the need for clunky FTL apparatus. And it's a neat concept, and it does look very cool, so I decided it would be a cool thing to try and replicate in Kerbal's space program. So. We have a small ship that can dock to a surrounding structure. That's that's the concept I started with. However, I was left with something of a challenge. I wanted the ring to serve an actual purpose other than just looking cool, but hyperspace travel is neither possible in KSP without mods, nor is it particularly useful since the game only contains a single solar system. So, you know, there's not going faster than light, you can't go very far. But then I thought, what if we did it the other way around? We create a vacuum efficient ship that has tons of delta V for space flight, but doesn't have the means to get itself from Kerbin surface into orbit, nor does it have the ability to safely land itself back at the runway once it's done all of its, you know, in space stuff. So, my proposition is rather than act as a hyperdrive system, the ring structure instead contains all of the engines and control surfaces necessary for atmospheric flight, and is an SSTO that can carry the ship to orbit without requiring any of the onboard fuel from the spacecraft itself, and you know what? I think it turned out pretty well. I think the biggest challenge was uh, creating landing gear that could safely support the weight of this very oddly shaped craft, and more importantly, could remain steady upon final touchdown. I didn't want the landing gear to be attached to the spacecraft itself, I wanted it to all be tied into the ascension ring, which is, by the way, what I'm calling this structure, uh, the Laon Aerospace Ascension Ring. I think it has a really good ring to it. Get it? A good ring to it? Haha! <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's the one downside to this craft, I think. Uh, for the ships in the prequels and extended universe, the ring structure would typically be pretty hollow aside from, you know, the small crossbeam that contained the docking system. The rest of the ring's internal area would be pretty empty with all of the guts of the craft confined to the ring's perimeter. However, uh, you know, because I needed to place parts of the landing gear to attach to, I have a slightly- I have slightly more internal assembly within the ring than I initially wanted. But nonetheless, I think it still turned out pretty good. And in fact, uh, it actually results in the central craft being housed in this sort of square tunnel shape, which looks a little bit more protective for atmospheric flight than just having the craft suspended via a docking port with no shielding under its belly. So, you know, again, I think it might be a, another happy accident. But look at this, I have waffled my way past the point of launch and we are now well on our way to space. Uh, I didn't mention it at the time, but you may have noticed Jebediah's extremely graceful entry into the cockpit. It's because I've got those uh, ladders facing opposite directions in order to, again, keep the ladders designed for disembarking and re-embarking the vessel when it's in the ring. Attached to the ring itself, I wanted none of the ring essential stuff to be inside the spacecraft itself. Uh, anyway, we are now in the air. Let's talk about the ascent. Uh, for the ascent, we have excellent thrust to weight ratio, such that despite the huge drag this craft creates, we could be pointing upward pretty much immediately and hold a fairly aggressive angle of attack. By 10 kilometers, we're going to start flattening out in order to pick up lots and lots of horizontal speed, but we do have to be careful because the cockpit of that central ship is very, very sensitive to heat and will likely explode if we go too fast too soon. Uh, once we start losing significant thrust, which is happened around this point in the video, about 20 kilometers, we can fire up the nuclear engine of the Starship. Now, although we're using the engine on the central craft, we're still only draining fuel from the ring. I've disabled the fuel tanks of the Starship itself for now, so that it remains fully fueled once in orbit and ready to detach from the Ascension ring. And that nuclear engine, you know, can push us pretty far, you know, we only had a very small amount of oxidizer for those rapiers to sort of kick us out of the atmosphere just enough that the nuclear engine has enough time to circularize the craft. Because we've only got one nuclear engine and the thrust weight ratio is not great, so we want to make sure we definitely had enough room 
to circularize. But we did, so it was all, it all worked out well in the end. And that was kind of the biggest challenge of this video, really all wrapped up, just making a nice contained ring structure that could bring this spacecraft into orbit. But then, well, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but we are about to circularize, so I feel like I can now talk about what the next stage of this mission would be. You know, we have a ship with over 2,000 meters per second of delta V. We need to go somewhere. I wanted the focus of this video to basically be showcasing the Hyper Ring, what did I even call it? The Lown Aerospace Ascension Ring SSTO craft, but it would be a shame to not actually go anywhere with that central ship. So I'm going to take the central ship out of the docking ring in just a second. Let's just uh, make sure the crew are all prepared for the undocking procedure. There's Jebediah at the helm in docking mode, according to that little screen just there. So we can right click the docking port, click undock in just a second. Uh, there we are, and then we're going to just use the RCS thrusters, of which you know, I've got lots of RCS thrusters there, and I've added some extra monopropellant tanks to those side-mounted uh, appendages of the spacecraft to give us lots and lots of room for docking. Uh, Redocking with the ring is going to be one of the more tricky things of this mission, just because A, it's not in a point where the, 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 the docking ports, I should say, are not aligned with either craft's center of mass or, you know, center of thrust. So we can't do the uh, quote-unquote lounge lazy method of docking. But more crucially is the ring itself is just a piece of debris now. It has no uh, means of controlling itself. It has no probe core. It has no pilot seat. So the ring can't really do anything to help facilitate our docking. We kind of have to dock to a piece of debris. So And obviously it's a pretty awkwardly shaped one. We've got to go through a little tunnel. And then again use docking ports that aren't aligned to our center of thrust. So it's going to be a fun little uh, journey this mission. But anyway, I digress. You may have already figured out at this point what our destination is going to be. It's going to be the Minty Flats of Minmus because I love visiting Minmus. It's actually one of my favorite places to visit. I don't know why. I guess because it's easy to visit, at least you know, once you've done so many landings on other celestial bodies. Minmus is such a nice, easy place to visit and it's a really nice and pretty destination, I think. Like, I love the mint ice cream flavored flavoured? <laughs> the mint ice cream looking surface that could be mint ice cream flavoured as well. Who knows? Maybe we could do that on our EVA when we touch down on the surface. But I really like the big flats of Mimus as well, especially for craft that have slightly more awkward shapes such as this one. Makes landing an absolute breeze. Another good choice, um, another reason why I should say Minmus is a good choice for this craft is because it has no ladder to get Kerbals from the hatch of the cockpit down to the surface so we need to land on somewhere where our EVA packs will provide enough thrust the Kerbos can just sort of fly up and down from the surface to the cockpit or vice versa. That does, in, in, in fairness, that is most planets and moons in Kerbal Space Program. The only ones we wouldn't be able to do that would be Eve, Tylo and Leith and I think that's it. And Jewel, for all the smart asses in the comments. <laughs> you know, do you know what I mean? It, it's a pretty safe bet the EVA pack's going to work. But, you know, it's nice to know that the EVA pack works very, very well on Minmus. In fact, it's quite well known at this point that you can pretty much visit every single Minmus biome with just the EVA pack, provided you uh, periodically return to your lander to refill your EVA fuel. But there we are. We circularized in Minmus. I went for a backwards orbit, in case any of you are wondering why I did that. It's just because that would have meant we could circularize at Minmus on the light side of the moon, which means the video looks a bit nicer, and that's literally it. Uh, and again, you know, Minmus's gravity well is so small that it doesn't really make that much of a difference if you're circularizing backwards or not, if that makes sense. I could have said retrograde orbit. If I was a good science YouTuber, I would have said retrograde orbit. But, you know, we are armchair astronomers through and through. And we choose to go to Minmus not to advance the scientific knowledge of our race, but it is to establish whether or not it does indeed taste like mint ice cream. I'm now I'm now going with this at that little verbal typo as the actual thesis of this mission. Uh, but there we are, all touched down. Now, if you choose to download this craft, which I hopefully remember to put a link to in the description, um, I had to bind the landing gear of the craft here to a separate action group to the normal action group for landing. Normally you'd hit G or, you know, the little on-screen button to deploy the landing gear. Because the ring has its own set of landing gear that we want to deploy independent of the landing gear on the Starship, I had to bind the Starship's landing legs to another group. I believe it might have been action group 8, not sure. But in case you're trying to deploy the legs in a pinch and pressing G is not working, that is why. 
And there is Jebediah, bravely planting the Laun Aerospace flag. Beautiful. And you know, while he's here, he can go on an EVA. Bill and Bob uh, choose to remain within the craft. First of all, because their capsule does not have a hatch itself, and I literally could not be bothered to transfer them one by one into the cockpit to go on an EVA themselves. But you know, they've got to run all their scientific data. We did all of our experiments upon touchdown. They can just go ahead and process the data whilst Jebediah goes and has a little inspection of some of the surface features on Minmus. We have this little rock just here, which came with the making ground. Making ground? I think I went to say breaking ground. Started saying making history and then tried to course correct after I'd already said the first word. Let's just move along from that <laughs> uh, back into the spaceship to begin the second phase of our trip, which is getting back into low Kerbin orbit so that we can redock with the Laun Aerospace Dissension Ring. It has now become, I think, once it's run out of Oxidizer, it becomes the Dissension Ring. I don't know, maybe it is still the Ascension Ring. Um, I haven't really, again, I've kind of, been, this commentary, I've just kind of been winging it, really. But, you know, we don't need wings on Minmus, segueing horribly to our Minmus ascent. Even the uh, abysmal thrust weight ratio of the nuclear engine is uh, more than a match for Minmus's gravity, as you can see. We've started flying flat pretty much immediately, and even though I was trying to be as conservative as possible with our uh, ascension burn, we still overshot our apoapsis, or at least we got our apoapsis a lot higher than we really needed it to be. Now, this craft did initially have a lot of fuel, and it was my original intention to not need to do this. Uh, I suck at maths, and I guess I didn't work out how much Delta V I would actually need for a Minmus landing properly. Um, we're going to have to do some aero breaks at Kerbin to get our orbit low enough to get an encounter with our ascension ring. Which, you know, it is a shame. I was kind of hoping to keep this thing strictly as a spacecraft only, with no real need for any interference with atmospheres, but I feel like... You know, it, it's not a complete use of the atmosphere. For one, we're going for a very low, uh, or very high periapsis, I should say. I think I went for about 51 kilometers, which, you know, is pretty high as far as periapsis go. We could have gone much lower safely. Not that much lower, to be fair, because again, that particular cockpit on this craft is very, very sensitive to heat. Regardless, we probably could have gone lower all the same. But I didn't want to take the make and I thought, let's just try and keep this as... You know, keep our interactions with any kind of atmosphere to a minimum when we're not docked with the Ascension Ring. So here we are, time warping down. Now one thing we're going to be doing, we're going to be doing several aero break passes because our apoapsis is very, very high up. We're going to do all of our apoapsis lowering using the atmosphere, but if we were to do the entire thing using that nuclear engine, we would unfortunately run out of fuel. So we're going to do the bulk of our slowing down using the atmosphere, but then once, you know, we're satisfactorily low enough where we have enough fuel left, we can do the rest using the engine. But we're going to have to do a few passes at first. Now, what you can see me doing here is I'm disabling SAS every time we exit the atmosphere just to conserve battery because this thing does not have an RTG. It only has that solar panel to resupply its battery reserves. Or if we're at a pinch, it does have the nuclear engine, which has an alternator inside it. But I don't really want to fire that engine unnecessarily. So I want to try and conserve battery whenever I can. And as you can see, on that little pass just then, when I time warped around, I forgot to disable SAS initially. And you can see how quickly... Our electric charge plummeted so this time we have to deploy the solar panel which means having to linger out in space a little bit longer from like a video making standpoint at least just to make sure that we have our electrical banks fully fueled full full of electric charge fully charged that was the word i was looking for Whew. it's been a very long day guys uh to be fair i'm not gonna lie to you i've just come back from a full day of work again and so you know it's times like this i want to just relax and what better way to relax them with a nice cold glass of whiskey. And you know, I was thinking about what whiskey to review in today's whiskey review, and my mind had wandered back to a tweet I made last week. It was a photograph of me and Beth in my garden drinking some glasses of Jack Daniel Single Barrel Select that Bob and I gave a 10 out of 10 to on the last whiskey review. But then I had Scott Manley reply saying that it's not really whiskey, it's bourbon. So this one's for you, Scott. Today won't be a bourbon review. Instead, we'll be reviewing the Yamasaki, a Japanese single malt whiskey. And it comes from Japan's oldest distillery. And that is what we're going to be reviewing today. Now, it's pretty pricey and pretty difficult to get in the UK. The only place I've ever found it is Sainsbury's, weirdly enough. Again, I'm not deviating from my standard, I only buy whiskey from supermarkets thing. But, you know, 
I get it from the Sainsbury's. It's usually about £45 a bottle when it's in stock, and to be honest, it very rarely is, at least whenever I attempt to buy it. But when I do see it, I do like to pick myself up a bottle because it is very, very nice. I've said before that I do have a preference for bourbon, but when it's other things, whether it's just scotches or whatever, I do have my little um, things that I, I like. That was a good sentence right there. And the Yamasaki is definitely my favourite Japanese whiskey. Uh, it's fresh, it's fruity, it has a really nice... It tastes a lot more similar to like your standard scotches than, say, your American whiskies. But regardless, it does have a very, very nice taste. I can enjoy a sip of Yamasaki whiskey very, very nicely. And it's one of those whiskies, again, much like the single bar select, that you can show people who don't necessarily think, or who don't think they like drinking neat whiskey or, you know, only very, very faintly diluted whiskey, and it's a real eye-opener for a lot of people. Like, it really shows you what a whiskey can be. When you're used to your, you know, your old number sevens or your Jim Beams or whatever, the Yamasaki is a really nice uh, entry-level whiskey into the better-tiered stuff. I don't know. So, Yamasaki, I like you a lot. If I were to score it, I would probably give it... Let me, uh, what, what have I given? I, I've noticed I've had, a, I've had a bit of a bias for uh, 7s and 7.5s. I would go ahead and put Yamasaki at an 8 on my whiskey review scale. It probably deserves higher, but again, I've just got a bias for the taste of bourbon. So that's probably why my bourbon scores are probably skewed a little bit higher than my scotches and everything else. But I'm going to stick with that. It is my personal whiskey review score, and an 8 out of 10. I would consider that a fair review. Very, very, it's a wonderful, wonderful whiskey. That's Yamasaki whiskey <laughs> all the way from Japan. And look at that. I have managed to completely avoid talking about probably the thing that needed talking about most in this video, and that is the process of docking back with the uh, Ascension Ring. So probably not a great maneuver on my part to start talking about whiskey during the docking, but I feel like I've talked about docking a lot. This is not the video for you if you want a tutorial on docking. I would recommend just watching a dedicated docking tutorial video uh, in terms of how to get close encounters. And I hope that, you know, just watching the process by which I docked to the ring, just looking at how I did it, is enough to kind of show you my methodology. One thing that kind of annoyed me though, right? I had to enable show debris on the map screen to find the ring so I could set it as my target. And there was loads of debris and low curb in orbit. And I know for a fact I have not left a single shred of debris in orbit from this, like, on this save file. Because you guys have seen all of it. If you want to see every mission I've ever done on this save file, you can just look at my back catalogue of whiskey reviews with Kerbal Space Program content in the background, and you can see for yourself. I think what happens is if you, like, switch vessels from a thing that's on a suborbital trajectory, but it itself is in space, such as when you're deorbiting a booster, and you don't let it deorbit itself, the game will probably just plop it back into an orbit around Kerbin, it won't let it just... That's the only theory I have. I don't really know, but I think that's why I've got debris in low Kerbin orbit, despite the fact that I've never intentionally uh, left it. In fact, I've always very purposefully made sure I don't leave debris in orbit. So that's uh, something we're going to have to solve maybe next episode now. We can do a deep space cleanup again. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, here we are, touching down. I realised I was coming in pretty fast, so I did a somewhat unrealistic... Uh, very sharp upward bank just to kill off lots of our horizontal speed very fast. Poor Bob and Bill nearly blacked out, but luckily pilot Jebediah remained rock steady and made sure he didn't come close to blacking out, and we can deploy those ladders and uh, provide a nice means for our Kerbals to disembark the vessel, but that's it! The mission is done! So I hope you enjoyed it. This was actually a really, really fun craft to not only design, but fly and just the whole mission. It was really fun. I really enjoyed it, and I hope you had as much fun watching it as I did flying it. But I'm going to leave you now with some links on screen. On the left hand side is a video chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation, Robots. And on the right hand side is just my most recent upload. There's also a link to check out my Patreon if you would like to check out my Patreon. And there's also a link to subscribe to the channel. And in the description you'll find numerous links to things like social media, Discord, Twitter, Instagram, all the good stuff, guys. Thank you so much for watching.